So I really like teaching Shakespeare. I think that it's fun. I like participating in centuries-long conversations about his plays. I can be confident making claims in class or taking conversations in particular directions because I know that there's a tradition behind them. I can confidently sit on the shoulders of giants. I can cite sources of authority for what I'm saying. There is always a bibliography in the description of these videos. But I also like teaching living poets. It's a much different experience when I take a poem recently published in a New Yorker class. I don't have those authorities to lean on. I've got to trust myself with the poem and be prepared for the unexpected. I'm vulnerable when I teach living poets. It's a risky move. I risk sounding stupid or uninteresting. I do it because I find reading poetry with people rewarding. Art connects us to other people. If my reading partners are academics from the previous 400 years, that's cool. I like that. I'll connect with them. If my reading partners are the two dozen 15 year olds in front of my face, still cool. Sometimes building connections on the foundation of art takes risks, but the play's risk usually pays off, or at least I can like guarantee it's gonna pay off. Maybe I can't say that either. I, it's likely it'll pay off. In Act 1 of Merchant of Venice, we learned about each character's desire. In Act 2, we're gonna learn about what they're willing to risk to get it. When I bring in a recently published poem, I risk my role as an authority figure because we are all equally new to the poem. I don't know any more than they do. I take this risk because one, I am on the side of art, and two, I want to build those relationships, and so I take the risk. In Act 2, Morocco, Jessica, and Shylock will all risk their stable roles for a chance at more meaningful connections with people outside their community. They make themselves vulnerable. They give up the comfort of the role that they have in order to see if they can expand their community. So let's go through this act, play by play, and develop this a bit more. So a lot happens in Act 2. It starts with Portia continuing to share her racist attitude towards the Prince of Morocco, which she originally gave voice to at the end of Act 1, Scene 2. That scene closed with her saying about Morocco that, if he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wive me. Meaning, if he turns out to be a good dude but has dark skin, she'd rather he hear her confession than be her husband. So Morocco arrives at Belmont in Act 2, and he enters without knowing that Portia is hostile to his heritage, and then he goes on to boast of all his accomplishments. He's clearly well-educated. He seems to be an experienced soldier. And of course, he intends to marry Portia. But there's the casket game. And in Act 2, we learn a bit more about what this casket game entails. Apparently, before choosing a casket, the suitors need to pledge never to marry anyone else, even if they guess incorrectly. So it's quite a risk. Here's a, a quick side note, though. Morocco is the only suitor for whom this particular risk is explicitly outlined, so it might just be Portia's racism trying to end an African bloodline, but more on that in a final video of this series. It might hold for everybody, and it's sort of unclear. A further note, a sort of corollary to that note, is that it's interesting that the two suitors from this act, Morocco and Aragon, are both coming from the south, or south of Venice. One is coming from Morocco, and the other one, Aragon, is coming from southern Spain. The suitors from Act 1 were mostly from northern Europe, France, England, Scotland, Germany, and so on. They all chose not to play, so it seems like Portia does not want a boy from the north, and they don't want her back, or at least they're unwilling to risk their future bloodlines. She also doesn't seem to be willing to want a boy from the south, though they seem to be willing to risk it all. Instead, she wants the boy next door, the one from Venice. She wants to choose her husband, and in choosing, she seems hostile to outsiders both from the north and from the south. We also learn that each casket comes with a little statement. The gold one, for example, says, Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. And notably, the statement associated with the lead casket says, Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. So that's interesting when we consider Bassanio's situation. I mean, can he give and risk everything he has? He has no money. In fact, he has a bunch of debt. He has the love of Antonio, and yeah, he is in fact risking that with the pound of flesh plot. So 
it seems like Bassanio is pretty well positioned for this game. The lead casket is obviously the correct casket, that's just like how these games work. But before all that, we have Act 2, Scene 2, and it begins with a barely comprehensible rant by a brand new character, Lancelot Gabo. In this rant, he outlines an internal conflict he's having. On one shoulder sits his conscience, which urges him to budge not. On the other shoulder sits the fiend, which urges him to use his legs, take the start, run away. An angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. He ultimately decides to run away from Shylock, who is his boss. So okay, this scene seems random, but I think it'll give us an interesting lens to look at the rest of the playthrough. This conflict Lancelot dramatizes in this monologue is a battle for his soul. It's called a Psychomachian drama, and it's a popular trope in Elizabethan theater. In fact, the most popular play on the Elizabethan stage at the time that Shakespeare wrote this was called Dr. Faustus, and it's a Psychomachian drama. In the play, Faustus is approached by a devil named Mephistopheles, who has him sign away his soul in exchange for more knowledge and the ability to travel through time and space. Notably, as Faustus is about to sign this contract in blood, his blood clots a little bit, and he needs to warm his hand before signing. Generally, this is interpreted as God trying to prevent him from signing the contract, but in a really subtle way. So you have a man. Faustus, with a devil on his shoulder, Mephistopheles, telling him to sign a contract, and God on the other shoulder giving him a gentle hint not to do it. The devil wins the battle for the soul of Faustus, and he signs the contract, and the play gets crazier from there. So now, if we take this framework that Lancelot has pointed us towards, we might look at the events of Act 1 with a little bit more complexity. Great literature is going to teach you how to read it. The obvious example here is Antonio. He signs a contract that uses his body as collateral. Shylock encourages him to sign it, while Bassanio lightly encourages him not to. This scene is basically straight out of Faustus, but a bit more complicated. The devil on Antonio's shoulder is a devil that he has created. The violent clause embedded in the contract is put there by a man who has been turned violent by mistreatment and bullying. Antonio has abused this person who now wants to enact violence upon his body. Antonio's treatment of Shylock turned Shylock into the devil on his shoulder. Similarly, the angel on Antonio's shoulder is an angel that he has created. He has invested both money and love into this person who now wants to protect his life. He has put Bassanio on a pedestal, and now Bassanio plays the role of an angel in his life, gently urging him to protect his body. Antonio is in a Psychomachian drama of his own creation. But there are other ways to look at this scene as well. Shylock also signs that contract, and if we put him at the center of the narrative, make him our Faustus, we could, for example, see him torn between Jewish Venice, his tribe, his angels, and on his other shoulder, Christian Venice, filled with his abusers, his devils. He enters into a deal with his devil the Christian Antonio, in hopes to win some respect and in doing so risks 3,000 ducats, his source of security, his livelihood. And also, he is in some ways risking his own soul, but we'll look at that in Act 4. The rest of Act 2, Scene 2, has Lancelot inexplicably play a trick on his poor blind father before asking his father to advocate on his behalf to Bassanio. Lancelot, like everybody else in this play it seems, wants to be close to Bassanio and his group of cool kids who spend money that they don't have and throw fun dinner parties every night. And bless Bassanio. For all of his faults, he accepts everybody. He'll invite everybody to dinner, even Lancelot, even Shylock. So Act 2, Scene 2 gives us a framework to look at the rest of the playthrough. And I think that Lancelot is going to keep on providing us with these moments as the play goes on. The scene also establishes Bassanio as inviting and charitable, and we learn that Gratiano absolutely must travel to Belmont with the crew, but that he has to behave himself. After that, in a short scene three, we learn that Jessica, Shylock's daughter, plans to run away from home as Lorenzo's partner and join Bassanio's dinner party crew as well. Everybody wants a piece of Bassanio's crew. And she'll do that in Act 2, Scene 6. And in that scene, Lorenzo is scheduled to escort Jessica away from her home so that they can run away together. Scene 6, however, begins with Graziano and Salarino waiting for Lorenzo, who is late. They even comment on how this is strange for somebody who's supposedly in love. 
Once he arrives, he says, not I, but my affairs have made you wait. Apparently, there are more important things in his life than Jessica, which is concerning because when she appears, she is clearly nervous about the risk that she's about to take. She's risking it all, and he's casually late. After exchanging some statements of love with each other, she says, here, catch this casket. It is worth the pains. And, you know, that word, casket, it's loaded with meaning in this play after learning about Portia's situation. Portia's caskets are the method by which her dead father still exerts control over her. Men need to choose the right casket. They are invited to play a game behind a drawn curtain. And Jessica just throws the casket down to her lover. This forces a larger comparison between her and Portia. Portia wants to be free. She wants to choose her own partner. But her loyalty to her dead father has her say in Act 1 that she will die as chaste as Diana unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. Whereas we have seen Shylock say very directly to Jessica, Lock up my doors, and when you hear the drum and the vile squealing of the wry-necked fife, clamber not up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces. So you have one daughter, Portia, who is willing to play by the rules established by her father and another daughter, Jessica, who is willing to break every rule established by her father. One of these marriages will happen within the bounds of the law and the other will happen outside of it. In fact, Lorenzo and Jessica will flee all the way to Genoa, outside the legalism of Venice and the coercive power of Belmont in order to get married. Jessica seems to embody the statement on Portia's lead casket. She will give and hazard all she hath. She is sacrificing her position in Jewish Venice, her father, her faith, and even her identity as she attempts to join the charismatic in-group defined by Bassanio and their collective pursuit of Belmont. She hazards her female identity since she has been transformed into a boy in order to escape her house and situation. She has her position within the Jewish community, her position as daughter, her position as woman, and she hazards them all in order to join Lorenzo, who was late to their meeting. Shylock doesn't take the news of his daughter's betrayal very well. He is overheard by the two gossips as equating the loss of his daughter to the loss of his ducats, and they have a cruel laugh over Shylock's misfortune. It seems like acceptance into Christian Venice demands that people not lend money with interest and accept a bunch of dinner invitations. Shylock has tried both of those things. He's put himself out there, he's risked something, and it didn't work. He's still mocked on the streets of Venice. By the end of Act 2, his daughter left him, stole his money, while he attended a dinner party and tried to accept the false hospitality of the Christian cool kids. And, rumor has it, Antonio's not going to be able to pay back his bond. Shylock has tried playing by the rules established by Christian Venice. He's tried responding to Antonio's aggression with kindness. He risked vulnerability and it seems he's lost. By the end of Act 2, he'll be on a path to try something different. If lending money and accepting dinner invitations didn't get him the respect he wants, well, then Antonio should look to his bond. But that's for Act 3, which we will be discussing play-by-play -play next time. Please subscribe to be notified of that future video and future seasons. Thank you for watching.